Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, brilliant new film, Extinction. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Today's session is part of our webinar series to address major long-term issues. And after today's webinar, our next event is conversation next week, April 21st, with Hillary Tompkins, who's an important figure in natural resources law and indigenous people's law. In today's webinar, I'm really excited to talk with three Stanford colleagues, diverse experts about extinction. And we'll be talking about the brilliant new movie narrated by David Attenborough. The three panelists for today's conversation are Paul Ehrlich, Rodolfo Gerzo, and Liz Hadley. And for those of you who've seen the film, you already know that Liz is one of the featured experts. Uh, my, my three colleagues today hardly need an introduction. Paul Ehrlich has been a, a leading voice for understanding environmental crises for more than half a century. And he really set the agenda for much of today's conversation about sustainability broadly and specifically about extinction. Rodolfo Dirzo is a leading expert in biodiversity of the tropics and particularly issues associated with what happens to ecosystems when animals are removed. He, he has basically brought that concept of defaunation to the um, broader community. And Liz, in addition to being uh, a featured film star in the new David Attenborough film, is really an expert in the Anthropocene, understanding the changes that people have brought to the Earth system over the last centuries, the implications of those changes, and the prospects we have for solutions. The format for today's conversation is I'll start with a few questions, and after about 20 minutes, we'll get to the good part questions from all of you in the audience. Uh, to get a question in the queue, type it at any point into the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. And after the webinar, we'll draft answers to any unanswered questions and we'll post them on the Woods website. You know, usually I, I give a little introduction to the topic, but extinction is so broadly known, so important and so serious that rather than provide some opening thoughts, I'll let the film that you've all seen speak to the issues and, and turn to my colleagues right away for additional insights on, on ways to understand and, and, and put the issues in perspective. And, and evidence has been building so beautifully and, and compellingly documented in the new film. And, and the new film is an important step in, in mobilizing people to transition from concern to action. And I wonder if, if you could speak, Liz, to the uh, to the other things that, that need to be happening and to sort of how you see a dynamic of galvanizing public opinion and, and pushing us over the border from just talking about it to really doing something about the extinction crisis. So doesn't this remind you of the climate change conversations from decades ago? Absolutely. Um, it's, <laughs> it's so analogous in many ways. We, we come to now where we're beginning really to globally recognize the problem and really kind of grapple with whether or not it's happening in our backyard or if this is just something that happens far away on the landscapes in Africa, for example. And I think um, my, my thoughts about this are the awareness is not quite done. Um, when I give public talks, I still get questions about, well, isn't evolution just going to take care of this? Or you know, extinction is, is part of life. That's what's happened in the fossil record. You, you know that. Why is this different? And so I do think that communication is always part of any solution. I also think that it's, we can all do something, I think locally, regionally, and internationally. And those are, you know, they all have kind of slightly different um, audiences and slightly different actions. But I think galvanizing people to think creatively about what you can do in your backyard 
but also how we can communicate better with our policymakers and what to do across international boundaries is key. In, in the US, I, I have a little quick example of thinking about tigers, for example, which we've been working on for quite a while. You know, tigers span many countries in Asia and every country calls, you know, they have the, there's the Malaysian tiger and there's the, uh, the, the Siberian tiger and there's the Bengal tiger and they're all the same species. And so one of the challenges is how do you kind of, in a sense, um, while appreciating the national ownership of these individual icons, right? How do you then collectively create plans across boundaries for uh, species survival? That happens less so in the US where we're both ba basically talking about species across states and it takes more of a, a national effort across state boundaries. But of course we have our interesting conversation with our Canadian and Mexican um, uh, borders. So I think that it's challenging just like global climate change is, uh, but I think action, the only way to save species is by not just individual um, individual species one at a time, but collectively elevating the value of biodiversity um, in our backyards and around the world. Let me start by saying I liked the film. I thought it was very well done. Liz, as usual, did a great job with her bit of it. Uh, I think an important thing to say to everybody is that we now know that the history of life has not been uniform. There have been a series of times of extremely rapid uh, destruction of biodiversity. And we know that a lot now about what has caused them. It's been mostly uh, huge amounts of volcanism which have changed the entire atmosphere and oceans. There is an exception. It looks like the volcanism that came around at the end of the, uh, of the tertiary, uh, excuse me, at the end of the, uh, yeah, at the end of the tertiary, uh, was caused by a meteor strike, as most of you have heard uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the end of the dinosaurs, although it looks now like that may have started another volcanism round. Uh, at any rate, right now we are several thousand years into uh, the sixth mass extinction, and the cause of that uh, is Homo sapiens. No other major cause uh, for example, we know that the large animals of North America that none of us have seen because they're all gone, uh, like ground sloths and uh, the native camel and so on, uh, survived many, many changes of climate as the earth went in and out of a period uh, of uh, ice ages followed by the kind of thing we have recently. Uh, and yet when human beings hit here, when they hit uh, Australia, when they hit most of Eurasia, they wiped out uh, the large animals. They're now in the process of wiping out even the insects. Uh, and since we are part of biodiversity and utterly dependent on those other parts, uh, it's really essential to bring home to everybody that we cannot continue to expand the human enterprise and expect us to have a survivable world with the biodiversity we desperately need. Yes, thank you so much. And let me turn to, to Rodolfo. Rodolfo, you, you have so much experience working in the tropics where such wonderful biodiversity is at risk, but also where some of the biodiversity loss is coupled with meeting, meeting people's day-to-day -day needs for survival. And how, how do you understand the extent to which the, the people in poor countries around the world recognize that there are serious issues here and feel that conserving biodiversity and preventing extinction should be a priority for them. It seems to me that uh, there is variation in that perception around the world, but I would say that many um, rural and indigenous communities do have a very clear sense of the problem, uh, a very clear sense and appreciation of the problem, because for many of them, maintaining of biological diversity, both uh, plant and animal, um, is so critical for the well-being. We talk about medicinal plants, we talk about uh, um, sustainable hunting, we talk about an incredible number of resources that uh, is present in this, um, in this exuberant biological diversity. 
that I, I believe they appreciate very much what the magnitude of the problem problems is. But um, you know, this growth mania and this emphasis in, in uh, getting um, resources and getting benefit in the short term, that uh, is one of the elements that pushes those communities to uh, basically set aside or, or dilute their appreciation and, 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 and need for these resources for economic benefit. Uh, in the film, we see a very striking case of the deforestation of this terrific ecosystem of the tropics, which is the Sahado, the equivalent to the tropical dry forest that almost nobody pays as much at, or nobody pays as much attention as we do in the case of tropical rainforest. Well, the Sahado is so critical for the well-being of the local communities, but now the emphasis in producing soy for exportation to other parts of the planet, uh, China, obviously, the UK, and some others, has created this uh, tremendous um, uh, dependence on the people uh, on these activities that they're diluting their efforts and the traditional knowledge and views and cosmovisions of, the, of, of nature there that I think is a tragedy that as, as, we, as, as we are losing biological diversity, we're also losing cultural diversity and cosmovisions of the way that nature works and the significance of nature for the local peoples. I think that we need to do tremendous efforts, not only in terms of appreciation, the loss of biological diversity, but what goes with it, including the uh, dilution and loss of cultural diversity. Liz, one of the things I really liked about the movie was the effectiveness with which rich world consumption was associated with biodiversity loss throughout the, the richest parts of the, the richest biodiversity parts of the world. And, and it so uh, squarely and effectively laid the responsibility where it should be with the high consumption lifestyles in the, in the rich world. I guess the, the question I have is, is, do you feel like that that message has really been hammered home? Uh, do people understand that that uh, that it's not just the purchase of um, of elephant ivory or or rhino horn that leads to biodiversity loss, but but all of our decisions in the marketplace have the potential to be positive or really really negative. Yeah. That, absolutely, uh, I I think that we have a lot more to do there, and and I think you know our backyard is a perfect example. So we have we're experiencing a monarch decline. Um, this is something we've been actively talking about in at, at Jasper Ridge and at Stanford in general over the last several months. Um, the monarchs have crashed, perhaps 99% of the population since the 1990s. Um, we don't exactly. For those who sorry, been thinking butter monarch butterflies. But, for butterflies those who haven't been thinking about them. Uh, monarch butterflies, those charismatic butterflies that we you know we all remember not that long ago, seeing everywhere. This is the Western um, uh, migratory uh, population. And they, this is one of the, the areas where just close to the coast where they overwinter and then migrate toward the Sierras and, and north into uh, Washington and Oregon. And, and monarchs are crashing and we have a role to play. But I think that is one of those things that makes people realize here that it's not just about the elephant declines in Africa that are critical. And it is, you know, I remember in the film when I was being interviewed, um, somebody asked me, well, what are the extinctions in the US that we're fearful of right now? What has gone extinct in the last decade? And, and that's the question people ask. They don't, Rodolfo and Paul both have done a lot on talking about population decline, numbers of individuals. And most of us think about these charismatic large animals, but insects are the base of the food chain. And without insects, we have you know, birds for the, you know, we have a limited bird biomass, we have limited bat biomass. And it's extraordinary how quickly insects are being eradicated uh, around the world. In some cases, it's up to 70 to 80% in just a couple of decades. We hardly have it well assessed in North America, but to see the crashing of butterfly populations, especially in the American West, is a bit of a wake up call. And I think we could do a lot more to talk about local, local impacts. I'll further say what gives us the right to criticize how people handle elephants in their backyard when we plow over and build over and, and plow under 
our own biodiversity. And so I think because we extract so many natural resources from the developing world, um, and in order for us to live the, the life that we're accustomed to, we actually um, could, could learn a lot by thinking about what resources we've actually uh, co-opted from our backyards as well. Chris, may I uh, uh, jump in here? Because Liz mentioned the critical issue, which is the loss of populations, the extinction of populations, because we, we are very much um, driven by the um, information and publicity about the global extinction of species. But really, the extinction of populations is, I think, the most dramatic pulse of biological extinction we've seen today. And in connecting that with your uh, previous comment and question, for local communities, indigenous or rural, the loss of populations is what's really, really critical. I mean, you know, obviously it is, um, they might hear about the extinction of the elephants or other, sp or other species in general, but for them, the local population, when it declines or it goes extinct locally, that for them is really the biological extinction of the species as a whole. And I really think that uh, paying attention to the extinction of the populations is a central element to be pay paying attention to. In the film, it is addressed, but I don't think it was addressed with uh, the emphasis that I think needs for us collectively to appreciate not only for us located in, in different locations, but also the significance of that for the local populations, rural and indigenous around the world. Just, just consider if we wiped out the honeybees in North America, we wouldn't lose the species, but it would cost us in the vicinity of $20 billion uh, in high quality food and the quality of our diets would plummet immediately. Uh, so uh, we get services from biodiversity that most people aren't aware of. Pollination is one of the most commonly thought of, but we still don't pay enough attention to it. Yeah. So can I, can I just underscore a little bit? I, I want to kind of emphasize both what Paul and Rodolfo said. And I think it would be good. I know the film did a good job of covering this, but, but I just want to say this in common words. You know, Paul said, it's all about us. It's the human enterprise. And what do we do? We, we limit the space for other creatures um, and, and plants. Um, we, we, we move nutrients, we change the nutrients, um, we move species around and those species include disease. We poison the air and the land and the water most of the time because we're trying to refine our own um, uh, civilization in some way and, and expand it. And we just deliberately kill things. Um, we, we use pesticides, we use insecticides, and they're getting more and more effective at eradicating those things we don't want to infect our plants. And in so doing, um, we're putting more and more into uh, the, the, the system. And, and I just wanna underscore that that has caused a dramatic change in, and then we also breed a lot of food in the term of in terms of livestock and grow a lot of food in terms of livestock and, and, and our monocultures, our plants. And so, you know, Paul mentioned the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, the Pleistocene extinction that included the ground sloths and the saber tooths. Even then, if we added biomass of large mammals from the Pleistocene, we still have six times more livestock in terms of biomass than we did in the Pleistocene. Um, and, and, and more humans as well. So we have replaced wild animals with ourselves and our domesticated animals. Liz, this is really very animals. interesting. The numbers underlying that are really striking. For example, at, at the uh, end of the Pleistocene, uh, animal biomass was about 300 million tons. Now it's about 1.9 right. billion, which is a tremendous increase, most of it accounted for by domesticated animals and homo sapiens. And wildlife has been uh, uh, left uh, to occupy just only 23 of the 1.9 billion now. Just well, looking at it from the point of view of biomass, it's a tremendous uh, pulse of uh, biological loss. We, we actually have more livestock than we did megafauna at the Pleistocene. And the reason oh. we do, the reason we do is because we've we basically co-opted the solar you know, photosynthetic system for us. And what we've done is we've mined all those past you know, eons, the, the Cretaceous lives that died and were buried. And, and so it, 
you know, what contributes to climate change is also ironically contributing to this expansion of humans and our commensal animals. One of the most compelling parts of the film is the explanation of how much biomass there is now of cattle and people and how little there is of, of what we think of as wildlife traditionally. And, and it opens a door to a conversation about whether the best way to protect biological diversity and limit extinction is to decrease the amount of livestock biomass. Is that the way we should be going? We should be reducing the biomass of human beings gradually, humanely, but it, you cannot solve this problem as long as you keep the human enterprise at the current level or higher. The best economist in the world, Partha Bastukta, just did a big study for the British government showing again the same thing. Dasgupta thinks we might be able to have a sustainable world and biodiversity with it at a population level of about three and a half billion. I think he's overly optimistic, but we're now shooting past eight. Uh, and unless we do something about that, first the people in the poor countries are gonna suffer more and then everybody's gonna suffer. I, and this is a desperate problem. It is not uh, something that just is, oh, well, are we going to have be able to see, will our grandchildren be able to see elephants and rhinos? The issue is, are our grandchildren going to be able to eat? Or I should say, my great-grandchildren. So, yeah. Chris, I think really, it was very effective in the movie, making that point as well. Yeah, Rodolfo. I was going to say, Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt, that related to, to your point about, about you know, um, the domesticated fauna uh, occupying so much space, that comes hand in hand with increased deforestation, increased fragmentation, because we need to accommodate all of these um, megatons of, of uh, domesticated biomass in some space. In the tropics, that means gigantic deforestation rates uh, with numbers such as these. For example, an area of the tropics that is good in terms of soil quality and obviously no, no uh, uh, no cold temperatures and so on, you can maintain 1.5 heads of cow per hectare. Imagine 1.5 cows in an area of a football field for you to keep that one animal to feed uh, us or to be exported to feed uh, other people in different parts of the planet. So, you know, the use of domesticated animals is not only the numbers of them per se, but they need the space that we're taking from nature. And from and because of that, we're taking it from other elements of biodiversity that should be there. We also move around just to you know, add on to what Paul and Rodolfo have said is, um, we also move around a lot of grain and, and water. Um, and you know, water is so extraordinarily valuable. And I could even extend this a little bit and, and Yes, absolutely. Reducing meat in our diet is very critical. Um, and also changing a bit of our, you know, our farming practices as well. So uh, Rodolfo mentioned the mismatch of, of the environment and the amount of production that it, it per unit area, given where that area is, how much, how many cattle could be produced there. The same goes for some of the crops we plant, you know, almond trees in central California are not the best use of central California, which used to be a giant uh, grassland. And so, you know, those trees, it's, it's, it's actually beautiful, but it's really stark. There's nothing under them. There's nothing. It's just dirt. There's not even, you know, understory. And the water is all either mined from, you know, ancient, you know, aquifers or, or it's co-opted from the mountains. So I think we have a lot to think about in terms of not just decreasing our meat consumption, but really thinking more creatively about how we can grow crops that are matched well for the climate in which they're grown. Let me, let me focus in a little bit more on this issue of, of human population size and, and the things we do to sustain and, and the consumption components. It, you know, I think the critical aspect of the point Paul made earlier is that in order to have a sustainable transition to a smaller human population, it really has to occur over many decades. And 
one of the messages I took away from the film was that the extinction crisis is, is really a crisis. It's something that needs to be addressed, not over many decades, but within a decade or two. And uh, it, it seems to me, uh, based on the evidence that I see out there, that, that animal agriculture is really a key, key feature. And, and the link of animal agriculture to deforestation, uh, to chemical inputs, including poisons as well as fertilizer, yeah. and, to, um, and, and to the sort of you know, amount of footprint that's required for each individual. There are lots of other issues with consumption as well, but it, it feels like meat, especially cattle agriculture, is really at the nexus of it. Is it's that right? at the nexus of it, and one thing we know from history uh, is that consumption patterns can be changed very, very rapidly when people understand the nature of the problem. We learned that in the United States after December 7, 1941, when before December 7th we produced close to 4 million mm -hmm. passenger cars, and after December 7th, very rapidly, we switched to producing tanks uh, and airplanes, and we rationed uh, various things, including meat, for example. Uh, and people put up with it because they felt the need. And we need that kind of mobilization in our general consumption, which, of course, consumption of cattle is one major feature uh, in that. Uh, it doesn't mean we should get rid of all cattle. You can feed more people if you use cattle in some circumstances, but you can certainly do much better uh, if you greatly reduce the biomass of domestic animals that we feed on. Uh, it can be done. You can't change population size humanely that rapidly, which means we should have started a long time ago on it. But nonetheless, we should recognize we're facing a vast catastrophe, uh, and there are a whole series of things we can do, not necessarily pleasant, but absolutely necessary if we're going to keep civilization together. I want to just ask one or two more questions before we go to, to questions from the audience. But before I do that, Liz or Rodolfo, would you like to weigh in on this issue of, of reducing the biomass of, of livestock, especially cattle? I absolutely think that's um, a very important first step. Absolutely important. And, and it's, you know, you can see a lot of this. Actually, I, I want to bring up our backyard again, because you can see a lot of this driving again through the Central Valley. You see these massive feedlots, and then you think, where is that coming from? You, you see all this manure in the waste, so the, the, ni the nitrogen waste coming off of these feedlots, how much food has to go in there, the lives they lead, and how sorry that must be. And, and so I actually, I totally think the way we do things is an important thing to consider as well. Um, I think that cow biomass, reducing cow biomass will do a lot. It's, it's a remarkable thing that, uh, for example, in parts of Botswana and in particular parts of southern Botswana that, that I, I, I love, the, the fences there that, that have basically stopped this, this, the Kalahari migration are because they're cattle fences and most of those cows are raised and shipped to Europe. Those are the cows in Botswana, this high biodiversity region has been closed off to biodiversity and actually native Africans. And it's, it's, very, it's, it's pretty much all because of feeding European populations. So it's not just what happens in our own backyard, but as Rodolfo brought up about the Sahado, it's also about cow production not for feeding Brazilians, but for feeding people mm -hmm. around the world. Argentine beef going to, uh, going to the UK. And, and, and I, I find that to be a really stark reminder about how important it is for us to know what we have on our plate, in our home, um, in, you know, in our life, and where it comes from, what the, the chain of, of uh, custody is for, that, for those products, and, and where it goes when we're done with it. Chris, I would like to add a quick another dimension to the things that Liz mentioned, which are, which are absolutely crucial. That perception, that appreciation of the significance of that trade and the tremendous footprints associated to that is just dramatic. But there is also the question of excessive meat consumption is not good for, totally. for the health of homo sapiens as totally. well individually. 
And, and also, there is this other question that deforestation to open spaces for cattle ranching and the infrastructure that goes with it to maintain those gigantic numbers of animals there also has consequences with another, uh, in relation to another aspect that is actually brought up in the film, and I think is quite significant. The um, um, relationship of that with the risks of zoonotic diseases. Yes. We open up these spaces, we increase the probability of contact of humans yes. with animals that have to move from the forest to be associated to human settlements, infrastructure, or the domestic animals, creating this vicious triangle there with um, the risk of increasing diseases. And the changes that we're making in the animal community are also, you know, not homogeneous. We are impacting particularly some groups of animals. And that has an ecological consequences that we're favoring other groups of animals. It happens to be, unfortunately, that those groups that are being sort of the winners now tend to be animals that are very good at, uh, at maintaining and serving as hosts of many, many pathogens as we are suffering today. <clears throat> One last question for me, and then I promise to go to the audience. And the film really compellingly makes the case that that land use, especially for animal agriculture, and climate change are sort of the two big threats to global biodiversity. And we talk about climate change all the time, and we talk about the way that intensive animal agriculture is contributing to climate change. But I wonder, maybe Liz, you'd speak to this, how you see the relative importance of tackling climate change as a defining challenge of our era uh, versus separate efforts to tackle the extinction crisis, which in many ways is probably more time critical, at least as time critical, and likely to transition into a much more uh, unsatisfactory set of outcomes in the near term than climate? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Um, you know, one thing I've found, especially speaking to very diverse audiences, is that when people think of conservation, they tend to lump climate change in there. And, and also when people think about sustainability and climate change, they just kind of throw biodiversity in there. And the point that you raised is a really important one. They're, they're not, they're sometimes in conflict. The solutions for the two of those uh, great examples are solar arrays, you know, in deserts that take up massive amounts of space, especially those that concentrate um, radiation. I mean, or our windmills that um, both of which can really lead to the demise of, of birds and bats in the vicinity of those areas. Actually, the bat uh, the bat mortality around wind um, windmills for power are is higher than that of bird diversity, especially when they put lights on the top of them, because insects are attracted to the lights and the bats are killed. Usually, they're placed right over those high mountains um, or passes right where the winds are the strongest, and that's also what flying animals need use to to move across the landscape. So. That's an example where, you know, having at the table somebody interested in climate solutions and somebody interested in biodiversity solutions, both need to be represented because if they're not, you can engineer a solution perhaps for climate that negates or disregards biodiversity and, and vice versa. You could probably engineer uh, biodiversity solutions that don't think about climate change. In my mind, they're very linked. Their causes all have to do with the extraction of fossil fuels. And as Paul says, the growth of the human enterprise, but all their solutions are not, um, are not so linked. And I think it's absolutely important to remember that biodiversity, extinction is forever. So yeah. there, there isn't a return for any of those species we lose. And I guarantee we'll lose a lot more than we want to in the very near future. The, the trajectory has been set. Very well, I very much like the yeah. comment that the climate experts and the biodiversity experts need to both be at the table and that we're not going to come up with satisfactory solutions until that's the case. Let, let me turn to questions from the audience. And um, I'm going to start with one for Paul. This one's from Roger Hine. I'm horrified by the loss of bio biodiversity that we're experiencing, but it seems to me hyperbolic to say that it threatens our survival as a species. Humans will be able to survive eating chicken nuggets and playing video games without coral reefs or things like, or, or rhinos and 11 billion others flying airplanes and eating pizza. 
is survival really in question? Well, there are two basic questions there. One is, will our civilization survive, or will there be small groups of human beings managing to get by on whatever is left? <clears throat> Until uh, the uh, actually way past the work on nuclear winter, I thought there was a very small chance of Homo sapiens itself being wiped out. I no longer think that that's so small. Uh, I agree with people, the most recent work uh, on nuclear war, small nuclear wars, uh, indicates that we could lose Homo sapiens entirely. Uh, the question on civilization is much clearer. Uh, all you have to do is really understand what happened in the past uh, mass extinctions to see that the mass extinction we're bringing on can easily bring down civilization. Uh, for example, uh, the, all of these things are tightly intertwined. We haven't even mentioned, really, the toxification of the planet, the number of chemicals that every mammal, all human beings, and actually virtually all organisms are now being infested with, and which are having uh, rather dramatic effects on things like sperm count. Now, you might think that reducing sperm count is a wonderful way to solve the population problem, Unfortunately, uh, when you get yourself uh, hormone-mimicking chemicals, they don't just affect your sperm or your eggs. They may also affect the development of your child's brain. I mean, it actually, there seems to me some evidence that humanity is already being dumbed down. Uh, if you weren't convinced of that over the last four years, I suggest just turn on your TV tonight. Uh, but uh, there is... No question in my mind or that of any of the people I work with that if we, and I mean the scientists, that if we continue on our present trajectory, uh, we are going to get swings uh, in temperature and humidity and general climatic patterns and ocean circulation, cir circulation and the amount of acidity in the oceans and so on that can easily bring down civilization. No problem at all. As a matter of fact, uh, scientists are having a hard time finding paths to sustainability. There's a lot of BS around about sustainability, but essentially nothing is being done about it. It certainly isn't really an issue on the political scene. Uh, so my answer is near certainty that civilization is going to suffer a great deal and possibly collapse in the sense that Jared Diamond talked about it some probability that is not teeny uh, that Homo sapiens itself, like every other species in the history of the planet, uh, will drive itself uh, to extinction. And I think that that contrast between the expectations for civilization and Homo sapiens is super useful. Uh, Liz, Rodolfo, do you want to weigh in on that one? Say a really great example is, um, is basically the pandemic. Right, so this is an example of, again, increasing human populations, uh, increasing exploitation of natural resources to feed us, um, increasing concentration of humans and animals and, and markets, and, and then our extraordinary ability to go anywhere in the world within hours. Um, the pandemic just shut us down instantly. It's incredible how fast our, the world, the way we knew it happened, uh, stopped. and. Uh, in my opinion, that's a really good example. And that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of how these things start unraveling. I went to a super bloom site a few years ago and I saw, you know, miles of flowers and I saw one butterfly, no bees. I mean, the, the drastic decline, not just in pollinators, but in the food supply for fish, for so many insectivorous animals. And, and uh, I, d I feel like we are not really grappling with the ecology and the interconnectedness of our, of our, and our dependence upon life on earth. Well, Chris, there are so many elements in, in, the, in, the, in the comment that Liz and Paul made. It's, they were so rich and there's so many aspects uh, in them. Um, I, I would like to take a couple of, of, of them. Paul mentioned the case that, um, that we have not talked about uh, pollutants and toxication. 
we have not talked about invasive species, yes. which is another <laughs> critical element in terms of the impact on biological diversity. But the point that I wanted to make, and I hope that is uh, related to the question of the person who had the question last, is that um, you know we tend to think that climate change is impacting biodiversity, that land use change is impacting biodiversity, that pesticides are impacting biodiversity. But in fact, what we're having, this is in connection with Paul's crisis of biodiversity, is that many of these elements are working together interacting in complex synergies, direct and indirect uh, ways, feedbacks and so on. So really the complexity, I mean, the, the magnitude of the issue is, is so gigantic that, uh, that we really need to appreciate uh, what that is. And in closing my comment here, which also connects with what Liz and Paul said, it seems to me that extinction being the truly irreversible global environmental change, really is a global environmental change that is irreversible as far as we are concerned or I am concerned. Um, what, when we talk about doing things to save the planet, I think really the existential problem is for homo sapiens. We have seen from the five mass extinction in the 550 million years in the, in the Phanerozoic that biodiversity and the planet actually can come back, but humanity <laughs> is in a very difficult situation there. I'll stop, but, but uh, there are so many issues related to this uh, aspect. Sorry about that. You know, it's, a, it's super important for people to understand the web of interconnections and, yes. uh, and the challenge of uh, addressing the problem through one entry point only. And I think if there's a takeaway message from this, it's to take a holistic view and recognize that we're going to have to work on a lot of problems at the same time, and yeah. some are more time critical than others. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. This one's for Paul from Julia Secula. Uh, are consumers enough to solve this problem or do economic systems need to understand the economic value of biodiversity for the real shift to take place? How much is valuing biodiversity part of the solution? The, the main problem with the economic system is what we call uh, the habit of most economists being daydream believers. They think we can continue to grow forever. The solution to everything is always more growth, but growth is a disease. It's the creed of the cancer cell, perpetual growth. Uh, and until we get rid of that, and that's one of the places where uh, Das Gupta's uh, report may have some impact uh, on economics departments, uh, where most people have no idea how the world works. Most economists have no training in natural sciences. I think most of them must never have had an aquarium with tropical fish or a garden to understand how important the environment and climate change is. You know, if you plant a, uh, if you, the heater in your aquarium in New York goes off, you have dead tropical fish floating around. Uh, if you plant a palm tree uh, in uh, Minneapolis, after the winter, you don't have much of a palm tree. We are driving rapid change in the climate, which is tied dramatically to the situation with biodiversity, which in turn, with the way the forests influence the climate and so on, uh, is feeding back on it. We have this incredibly rapid acceleration of change, which can only lead to disaster as long as we have growth and people, for example, who say it's not population, it's consumption are like people saying the area of that rectangle is only due to the width, not to the length. Population and consumption are basically two sides of the same coin and overconsumption is what is not just destroying biodiversity, it's destroying the habitability of the planet for homo sapiens and those of us who are homo sapiens ought to be doing one hell of a lot more about it. Okay, in that context, let me ask a question. This is from an anonymous attendee for, for Liz. There's a climate change summit. It's coming up next week that where Joe Biden has invited leaders of over 40 nations to participate. It's very focused on emissions. Uh, how can we include the biodiversity crisis in the conversation and policy discussions? And maybe you'd want to comment on the extent to which it's already reflected as you understand the climate summit. Uh, I do not understand. Perhaps you know more about how biodiversity is specifically represented in, in the summit. Um, I, 
I am uh, super interested in engaging more at an international level um, in, you know, in, in bodies like IUCN for sure. But also I'm doing a lot more work uh, and I have been doing a lot more work in the state of California, which isn't exactly addressing the question. Um, and perhaps you'd like to answer how biodiversity is represented in that in the climate summit, Chris. Well, you know, I, I think that the Biden administration has a totally laudable emphasis on emissions reduction, and emissions reductions are certainly one piece of this complex web of, of tackling biodiversity loss. But I think that in many ways, uh, biodiversity loss, the extinction crisis is being asked to wait in the wings until we get yeah. climate under control. Yeah. And I think that that's got the order reversed. So, so I will say there's one thing that Biden has advanced that California has too, in, and that's the 30 by 30 initiative, which is 30% of land and sea as protected somehow. And California, you, you know, we have quite a lot of natural lands. We're blessed with quite a lot. A lot of, our gov a lot of them are government lands. And we saw what happens when you have the, you know, the whims of a politician who doesn't care about nature, what could happen very rapidly to natural lands. And so I think coming up with protections for those places is one way to make a difference for biodiversity, but it's clearly not the only way. We have one law really that, that, that has bite in it for species specifically, and that's the Endangered Species Act. And the way it's been used in the past in many cases is a way to try and elevate a particular species for, a, you know, for an ecosystem. Ecosystem protection has been done mostly by things like national parks or national forests. Sometimes state parks and state forests can do the same thing, but, but uh, we don't really have uh, biodiversity protection in the same way that, um, that, that we should. Rodolfo, do you wanna add to that? I, thank you, Liz, very much. I would like to, to uh, add uh, to your terrific comment that we need more uh, mainstreaming or perception by the general public about uh, the, what is at stake with bio biodiversity laws. Of course, I don't want to minimize climate change. It's a critical, critical issue. In some sense, in, in, from the public's perspective, it's kind of a sexy global environmental change. But biological diversity needs much more attention. I was so um, happy to see that in the film, Partha Dasgupta actually mentions the case of uh, education and communication. And he yeah. also mentions the case of children, which to me is really quite, yeah. quite significant. So to the extent that we do things such as this, Chris, you know, when we communicate with the general public and bring um, what we understand of the crisis or the situation of biodiversity loss, I think the more we do on that, the chances of increasing um, public and political perception of what is at stake with biodiversity loss are we going to be in a better situation? Rodolfo, let me follow up with a question for you that just came in. The question from an anonymous attendee, it says, other voices need to be at the table and are indigenous voices? Uh, where, where do you see this happening and what can we do to encourage that? Um, I think there is a fantastic uh, uh, view of indigenous communities about biodiversity. And we, I mean, we have seen that even now in United Nations meetings and in climate summit meetings, indigenous people have been a part of the conversation there. Um, I think that the views, cosmovisions, perceptions, and appreciation of indigenous communities is really, really mm -hmm. something to be concerned in rescue. Mm -hmm. Also, we need to pay attention to the fact that many indigenous communities are making significant efforts in maintaining protected areas or in maintaining you know, mosaics of areas with different types of land use within a single landscape. Uh, and we have many wonderful examples of, say, for example, sustainable forestry management in different parts of the planet run by indigenous communities. So I really, really think that uh, this is another voice that we need to have in the conversation, very much so. Paul, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm only going to say one word of this question and I'll let you extemporize <laughs> from there. The extinction. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll say it again, oh. please. <laughs> so, yeah. This is, uh. this is one of the most idiotic ways of trying to give work to not very smart scientists, because, of course, uh, it is 
virtually impossible to do de-extinction today and may always be, that is to uh, recreate passenger pigeons uh, by modifying band-tailed pigeons into something that looks like a passenger pigeon. But the problem is, of course, if you rebuilt passenger pigeons, what would you do with them? In order for them to survive, you must make millions, maybe billions of them, and there's no habitat. Uh, the point is what scientists should be doing today, all scientists, is dealing with the existential problems now facing humanity, the whole array of them, all tightly intertwined, all very political, all needing a great deal of input from the social sciences and from literature and from art. We changed our whole view of the planet with one picture of Earth from the moon. Uh, and we need much more participation from all of humanity and from all of the disciplines to solve this gigantic problem. All the stuff we're talking about all of which I agree with, the things we ought to do, like eat less, less meat and uh, we should not waste so much food and so on. These are all trivial little things on the edges of a gigantic problem that really require a total revision of human culture. Whether we're going to get it or not, your guess is probably as good as mine. I can't say I'm wildly optimistic. Chris, may I very quickly chime in and try and connect your, your previous comment on indigenous peoples and what Paul said, even in efforts uh, in trying to do sort of rephonation or rewilding of some areas, we again will need the habitat where these uh, attempts can actually be fruitful. But also I would like to mention that in connection with your point about indigenous peoples is that as far as I have seen in many cases, certainly Latin America and in Africa, attempts to do uh, restoration involving uh, animal life in them, they usually do not work unless the local community is heavily involved and embraces the project and is part of the project directly. So, so can I, I wanna add on to this and also on to the de-extinction point. Um, right now there's a big move, actually some you know, Twitter uh, discussion about bringing back the mammoth. And I, I know Rodolfo and Paul will join me in thinking about what, a, what, is, what an idiotic idea it is, and also just tragic. It, the mammoth existed in the Pleistocene, an ice age. This is an interglacial headed to something that we haven't seen in millions of years in terms of our climate. We already have, as a matter of fact, the demise and, and the threatening of native cultures around the Arctic. Why? Because there is no tundra because you know, the oceans are too warm, because their subsistence patterns on the ice and, and in the sea are threatened. The, the nomadic reindeer herders, the Sami are threatened also because of the major mortalities due to climate uh, induced challenges to their herds. And I'll finally say that this is where learning a little more biology is super important. And again, going back to this interconnectedness of life, an animal like an elephant or a mammoth is not just solitary being that, you know, why? Why would you bring it back? It has a microbiome. Our living elephants have microbiomes. They learn from their mothers and their families what to eat. They learn where to go to find water. How do you bring something back? To me, the tragedy is imagining a single human, for example, in a sea of diversity with no other human on the planet it seems just tragic to me and i don't know how it would you know how these animals would even manage to digest their food let alone know how to survive so to me it's all wrapped up in our in our sense as what paul said and, and i want to underscore Rodolfo's too education is super important and all of these things are linked yeah the uh, the the tundra, which is disappearing, is outgassing so much methane that the science, the best scientists looking at it fear for the future of humanity because we may just bake ourselves away, in part by destroying the tundra and the methane clathrates underwater in the Arctic. We're pretty much at time, but I do want to I want to uh, pose a question for each of you. So we, we've already talked this afternoon about the value of additional insight about what's really going on. We've talked about the importance of understanding the way that ecosystem services uh, support the human dynamics. We've talked about the role of 
decreasing animal agriculture. We've talked about the importance of setting aside space for nature with the role of programs like 30 by 30. And we've talked about the long-term need for uh, what Paul characterizes as total transformation of human culture. And, and that obviously could include a lot of things, but if, if there's one step that individuals can take either through their purchasing habits or through the ballot box, what's the, the element that can make the most difference in 2021? Paul, let me start with you. Uh, I would say following uh, the, the work of uh, Wines and uh, Nichols, uh, have one fewer child. That's the equivalent of giving up driving 23 times in a wealthy country. Uh, so that's a step everybody can take while they put 15 or 20 percent of their time to, into doing things like we've discussed, the many, many steps we should be taking now. Liz? I'd say uh, think about actions that are local and regional and international. And, I, and, and that sounds good, but I think fostering biodiversity in your backyard a lot, something what a lot of people did during the pandemic. And, and I think we should continue to do that and think about what you can do, think about how that system would work. I think when people love places, they act differently and they work hard to protect them. So find the place you love and do something to protect it. And Rodolfo. I would I would say that communication has a has a, a central role to play here, and uh, I mean exercises such as these are so so important because then people become ambassadors of the message that we want to convey. I would like to also mention a little bit of a connection of of education and communication with, with Paul's message. It seems to me uh, certainly the countries that I am most familiar with, uh, Mexico and many others in Latin America and in the developing world. There is no education about what fertility is in the human population. We need to bring this component of education into the basic understanding of this problem at the level of education, basic level of education and, and beyond. So education, 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 and understanding of, the, of what is at stake in terms of the, uh, um, in terms of the existential problem for humanity, not so much or not necessarily the uh, it's existential threats for the planet. Humanity is at stake. The new film, Extension, The Facts, with David Attenborough, Liz Hadley, and many other experts. If you haven't seen it, it's a, a compelling, beautiful, gripping narrative about the risks we face. And the conversation that we've had today really helps people understand why the issues are so important and really brings a critical focus to I think the issue that should be the defining issue of our, uh, so thank you, Liz, so much. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you, Paul. Thanks everybody in the audience. And thanks to our- Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. With uh, Molly, Justin, Athena, and uh, so long. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Molly. Thank you, Chris.